things are going to happen. Yes, things God. are going to happen. But we look up. We look up and we just worship him and give it all to him. Even though we don't understand his purpose, we have to trust his will. Amen? So no matter what you guys are facing, no matter what you guys are going through, let's praise him. Let's just lift our hands and thank him in all things. Amen? Amen.
beautiful name it is. See, nothing can stand against what a beautiful name it is. The name of, sing it with us, come on. What a beautiful what name. A beautiful with us.
times get dark, people look for light. Whenever times get dark, people look for light. So this is a great time for the church to do really well inviting people to come and learn about Jesus. Isn't it? But I want to teach you something this morning. And you're going to see some changes. We're training all of our leadership. We're training all of the people. If you were to invite one of your family members to church on Sunday who was maybe addicted to drugs or didn't know God or was an atheist or a devil worshiper, we have previous devil worshipers here that have been saved and now are teaching in children and youth. Amen. Here's the thing. Would they understand what we're doing? No. So the church on Sunday is mixed. And a lot of times we're so Christian-y, we don't even think about it. We tell people, lift your hands. A person who doesn't know God is like, is the police coming? <laughs> See, no, you're laughing, but it's true. What if I don't know God? And you're saying, Jesus, and I want to dwell. And they're like, who is Jesus? We had a man come to church a couple months ago. He said, I've never been in church in all of my life. He said, I have stage four cancer, and I think after today, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But he had never been in church. So you're going to see us begin to talk differently and explain things differently. So now I want to give you a different definition of worship. And I don't even know, maybe you might not know this, Kenny. And you're like a deep worshiper. A person that's addicted to drugs. I've had friends die of that. Some of you have had friends and family. How many guys have had anybody addicted to drugs around you? They chase death, but they keep chasing it. Can I tell you what worship is? Priscilla, you ready? Worship is you chasing life. Wait a minute, what? Worship is you chasing life, Ginger. It's, it's we play this music and all of a sudden you feel a peace and you don't know where it comes from and because when you worship God comes wouldn't you come if they were giving you an award would you show up so worship is like giving God an award on Sunday and he says I'll come since you're talking about me and when he comes he changes the whole atmosphere and if you don't know God here's what you need to know as a drug addict chase death a Christian chases the presence of God, which is life. And then, when God comes, people get healed. What do you mean, Pastor Mark? I mean, the doctor said someone was sick. They come to church. Jesus comes to church. They meet. And now their sickness goes away. And we have people here verified by the doctor. I tell you this all the time. One of HIV completely healed because of Jesus. So when we tell you we invite you to worship, just think about it like this. For a couple of minutes, I'm going to chase life. I'm going to chase the one who created me, the one who can reverse sickness and disease. I'm going to chase the one who loves me before I even love them. That's what worship is. That's as a drug addict chases drugs, a Christian chases the presence of God. So one more time, can you lift your hands? I'm inviting you. 
Even if you don't know who Jesus is today, just try. Lift your hands. And you'll feel the difference. There's nothing left. Come on. My love sings to you. Say, oh. focusing on the problem. the voices one time. Say, one thing I desire, one thing I desire, only this I yes. see, only this I see, just to, just to dwell in your presence, God. This will yes. be my posture. This will be my posture. Say, laying at your feet, laying at your feet, just to dwell. Just to Father, we love you so much. Father, I know some of us don't know you, but we'll get to know you. I thank you for the ones that do, that they'll invite people who don't know you. And I thank you, God, that our church will not be a barrier to those that might not know all the things that go on at a church service, but that they'll come and simply find your son, Jesus. That they'll come, and as we worship who know God, they will feel a difference in their heart and even in their mind and even in their body. I pray that they would be healed in Jesus' name. I pray that this will be a place, Father, where we're going to talk about it today, where curses are broken over our lives. 
even generational curses, God, that came down from our parents and our grandparents, God. A curse is just negativity that is flowing that we didn't even know was there. I thank you that today, Lord Jesus, you would come, and as we learn from your Bible, you're going to show us through the word, but through demonstration as well. I thank you today people will be healed in their hearts, in their minds, and in their bodies because we worshiped you. We chased life this morning, and we honor you for being here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Come on. Beautiful praise and worship. Beautiful. Come on, you can do better than that. Stay on the Man, all right. How's everybody this morning? Huh? You guys look so pretty and handsome, but you should know I can't see past the second row because of the lights. So just, if you're behind the second row, just go like this, Anthony. Mm, 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 mm. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Amen. God is great and God is good. How many of y'all know God is good regardless? Huh? How many of y'all know God is good regardless? Amen? All right. Well, we want to welcome you here to Abundant Living Family Church, High Desert. We have passion for God and compassion for people. That's just very simple. It means we love God with everything that is in us. And if you love God, then you, all should, you should also love people. Amen? If you say you love God and you don't love people, you lying about the first one. Some of y'all say, I love some people. <laughs> Come on, that ain't right, amen. Good to see you, Pastor JC. Good to see you. All right, we have a creed here that we say, and if you're a visitor, this is what we are about. We try to do six things, and these six things are very important to us. So put your hand over your heart. On the count of three, I'm going to move out the way so you can see it. On the count of three, let's repeat it together. One, two, three. We are abundant living, and we receive the life of Jesus. Our families, our friends, our community will know about his life. We will experience abundant prayer. We will provide abundant care. We will pursue abundant health. And we will increase through abundant wealth. We will love in our abundant families. And we will commit to abundant service. We are abundant nation. And we will know him and make him known. Come on, give him a, ha a shout. <laughs> Prayer, health, wealth, family, service, and we're going to care for people, Frank. Amen? All right. How many of y'all were here last week? Three and a half people. <laughs> so you three people, how many of you learned something last week? Amen. So powerful. It was called, what did you say? Look at your neighbor and say, what did you say? And we were talking about, Sean, the power of words. We want to welcome our Facebook audience. Everybody scream real loud. Say hi. hi. So we appreciate you. We know you're sitting in your pajamas. But that's all right, as long as you're listening. Amen. So we're in a series called New Truths from Old Stories. How many of you know just because something is old doesn't mean you can't learn from it? Come on. And one of my wishes is that, Mark, that we don't look at the Bible, that we stop looking at the Bible as a historical book, even though it is a historical record, Mike. But even though it's history, we can still learn from it and we can still access, Mr. Dolores, good to see you, from some of the truths, right, that are in it. And it's so important. So I still want you to grab the word that we heard, Margie, on Resurrection Sunday. Jesus Christ's power to restart things is still in the earth. But because it's a religious holiday, because we've attached the Easter Bunny to it, because, Miss Sylvia, we've attached getting candy, we go, oh, it's Easter. And then Christians that are fancy say, oh, it's the Super Bowl. And then all this effort goes around one day, and then the next day, Patricia, we ain't even worried about it. I want you to know that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he gave power to every situation that will ever come up in your life. And if something is dead in your life, relationships, Shanti, are dead in your life. If your relationship with your children is dead in your life, if your job seems like it's dying, that Jesus Christ still has the power to restart things that are dead. 
So when we read the Bible, we have to pull, Teresa, these new truths. Are you guys ready? Today's going to be heavy. Last week was heavy. I feel like God wiped away words we had been speaking over ourselves, words we had been speaking to Tanya over other people, words we had been speaking over our situations. I heard a quote this week that was so powerful. It was so powerful. Are you ready? Ready, Lorraine? People are not watching your circumstance. They're watching how you respond to it. Oh, you should write that down because it's not on your notes. People are not, well, maybe it is. I don't know. People are not watching your circumstance. You know, Miss Peggy, you know why? Because they have their own circumstance. What people are looking for, and this is where Christians, we got to do better. What people are looking for is a different response to the circumstance because of Jesus in your life. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, give Jesus a shout. People want to know that your Jesus is alive and they want to know he's alive in you. And one of the reasons people don't believe Jesus is alive, Austin, and that he was raised from the dead is because the Christians walk around, have a dead attitude, a dead spirit, dead words. But God wants us to speak life. Amen. Now, you got to get ready today because I'm going to show you something today. I did a, a men's group and it was just overwhelming. The Spirit of God just fell, so you need to be ready at the end of service for God to come in this place and do some things inside of you that maybe not even you see. Are y'all scared? Some of y'all are like, it's ghost coming, it's a ghost coming, I'm scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. But how many know, Priscilla, there are things inside of us that even we don't know. Can I tell you why? They were handed down from your great-grandparents. And because you never saw your great-grandparents, some of you have not had the privilege of seeing your grandparents. Some of you might not have had the privilege of seeing your parents. But the Bible says that a curse, which is a negative pattern, can come from the third and the fourth generation. Miss Rita, the good news is that God says to counter that, blessings come a thousand generations. So, Miss Deborah, you can be blessed for a thousand generations, but you have to listen to me. You can be and feel the effects of curses back to three and four generations. But here is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. After this service, it will be broken over your life, and you won't be dealing with it anymore. Your children won't be dealing with it anymore. Somebody better be clapping and shouting. And your grandchildren won't be dealing with it anymore. Some of you are addicted to things, and you don't know that it was handed down to you. Some of you are sick, and you don't know it was handed down to you. Some of you can't stay in a positive relationship, and you have no idea, it's not your fault, that it was handed down to you. Because when one generation is broken and doesn't turn to the fixer, who is Jesus, they break the next generation, and they break the next generation, and they break the next generation. And somebody has to attach to Galatians. 3.13. Well, what does Galatians 3.13 say, Pastor Mark? I'm glad you ask. It's as cursed as every man that hangs on a tree. And Jesus was made a curse for us. So even though your grandparents handed down stuff to you, when Jesus died on the cross, Twyla, he canceled it if you'll receive it. <laughs> does this make sense? So today we're going to read the old story, Maurice, and I'm going to take one of the most famous characters in the Bible and show you something about his life that the average Christian misses. Everybody say generational, generational. reaping and sowing. Woo-wee! How many of y'all know about reaping and sowing? Hmm? Okay, let me say it like this for the young people. How many of y'all know about karma? Oh, Okay. Brooke, karma is just another word for reaping and sowing. Every generation tries to rename it. So today we're going to look at that. So I already said all that, so I'm going to skip it. This is very important. Are you ready? You can break a law, but principles, when violated, break you. Uh, you can break a law. Some of y'all did that driving her. Me and Pastor Kendra almost got hit coming out the driveway. 
It's my friend, though. He got a little convertible. He was like, cool, it's Sunday. Ain't nobody in the neighborhood. He was like, Aah! I'm like, we in the neighborhood? Two people going to church. They about to hit each other. So he might have been speeding. You might be speeding when you go down the hill. And you can break the law. Sometimes you get caught. Sometimes you don't. You ready? When you break a principle, you always get caught. That's a good one right there, huh? Miss Karen, it's good to see you. You can skip breaking the law and not get caught. But when you break a principle, it will come and it'll break you. There is no flexibility with principles. You can tell me, James, good to see you. I don't care about gravity. So get on the roof and jump. <laughs> gravity loves you. <laughs> Principles cannot be adjusted. Watch this, Pastor Dory. They can't be negotiated with, and they cannot be canceled. If God says something, like reaping and sowing, I'm going to show you. If he says something, it can't be canceled, and it can't be changed just because you're sexy. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm sexy. Some of y'all don't want to say it. And you shouldn't. No, I'm playing. <laughs> we can only trust God's nature and ask for mercy. So watch this. At the end of service, we're going to cover everything, Tanya, and we're going to ask God for mercy. Can I tell you why? Because most of us were broken from our parents. Sorry, Mama. Most of us were broken from our parents. You got to apologize to your mama, right? She used to beat me for no reason. She would just wake up, come in with a stick, and just beat me. I'm playing. You was a good mama. You took me to Dairy Queen every Friday. That's why I have diabetes. But anyways, anyways, sometimes we can only just ask for mercy. And what we're going to do at the end of service today, after we learn this, we're going to ask for mercy. How many of y'all love that? We're going to ask God for mercy because some of us broke our children and our grandchildren. Some of us are breaking our children. But it's because we were broken by those generations. So at the end of service, regardless of what side you're on, we're going to ask God for mercy. And can I tell you a secret? God already told me, Frank, he's going to grant it. He told me this week in my prayer time. He says, if you'll preach this, I'll come. You guys, so many miracles happened last week. We were talking about your words. People were getting texts and getting calls right in the service from people that lived out of state. And they were canceling what they said. They were canceling words like the Bible said. And their phone was ringing in church. Jesus isn't playing and he just wants us to believe. Make sense? All right, so here's the scripture, Alex. Here's the scripture that we have. Now, there's more. There's some in Genesis, Keith, but here's Galatians 6, 7, 8, and I'm going to read uh, 9. I'm just going to do it by memory. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. That means you can't make fun of God, and you can't ignore what he says. God will not be mocked. A man, and that's woman too, a man, that means humanity. Humanity reaps what they sow. So, if you don't know these terms, these are farmer terms. So literally means to plant. So when you plant something, you will reap something. When you plant something, you will reap something. When you sow something, you will reap. What does reap mean? Gather. It means come to you. Whoever sows to please their flesh... Now, most people don't know what their flesh is. They say, Paul, oh, my flesh is my skin. They think they can pinch their flesh. Your flesh, when it comes to the Bible and God, is not just your skin. It is not just your covering. Your flesh is the combination, are you ready, Mike, of your soul and your body. You are a spirit that possesses a soul, mind, will, and emotions that lives in a body. When a person lays in a casket, we are looking at their body. Their soul has departed. It either went up or it went down. We pray it went up. Make sense, Brooke? 
Their spirit is gone. The spirit is the life force of a person. So the spirit has a soul and they both live in a body. When you become a Christian, your spirit tries to be number one because your soul has been number one until that point. What do you mean, Pastor Mark? Your mind, your choices, and your emotions have been running your life. This makes sense? Your mind, ability to think, your will, your ability to choose, your emotions, your ability to feel have been running your whole life. Then you find out you're not too good at running your own life. And Jesus has been knocking at the door the whole time. He wants to save you. You say, what do you mean save? Y'all Christians always talk about being saved. He wants to keep you from going to hell when you take your last breath. That's what save means. He's trying to rescue you. And when he comes and lives on the inside, he turns on, Margie, your spirit that has been dead to God. And now all of a sudden, the real you connects with God. And then the fight starts to happen because now your mind, will, and emotions don't want to be second. But the Holy Spirit who is now in you wants to be first. So the scripture says, whoever plants to please their soul and their body, this is huge, from the flesh, their soul and their body, will what? Reap destruction. What does reap mean? Gather, Miss Romary. Reap means it will come. So when you pay attention to your mind, will, and emotion, which is attracted to the world system, and you give your body whatever it wants, whenever it wants, Cheetos in the middle of the night, like Pastor Kendra be eating, <laughs> ruffles in the middle of the night, like Pastor Kendra be eating. I have carrots on my side. Next week, we're going to talk about lying. <laughs> well, from the flesh, reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, whoever sows and plants to please God, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So repeat after me. That was a good explanation. You get it? Because I'm setting you up. We reap what we sow. Always. Because it's a principle. Not a law. These are some of the basics. In Hebrews chapter 6, Sonia, Paul says, let's not get away from the elementary principles. Come on. And see, the, last week was elementary. Watch what you say. You can't say you're, t you're fighting for your marriage and you say, man, I'll be so glad when they die. People talk like that. What you say has to be from the word of God. And if it is from the word of God, then it'll bring life. If what you say is out of your head, then you will bring death. Does that make sense? So we reap what we sow. All right. Now, I'm going to give you a story. And everybody knows the character, even people sitting here today that don't know who Jesus is. Because somebody took him to Sunday school at some point or took him somewhere and they heard about David and Goliath. So just by a show of hands, how many of you know the story of David and Goliath? See, almost everybody. I was watching wrestling Friday. I mean, Kendra was watching wrestling on Friday, <laughs> Friday Night Smackdown, and they had this small guy wrestling this big guy, right? His name is Ricochet. He was wrestling this big guy named Shanky. Shanky's like 6'11". Ricochet's like Five, eight, if I give him a little extra credit. And they were fighting, and they were talking about, this is a David and Goliath scenario. And I said, wow, Shanti, these people on wrestling know David and Goliath. They probably don't go to church at all. <laughs> so David is known for Goliath, but he's also known for Bathsheba. And you're about to hear a principle today that's the old story, but a brand new truth. And I'm going to connect some dots that are going to blow your mind. Are you ready? So in the book of Acts, now Acts is not in the Old Testament, but sometimes the second half of the book, Mom, talks about the first half of the book. The New Testament refers to the Old Testament. Does that make sense? 
So it refers to stories, JC, because the principles are still going. So the book of Acts is where Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right, then Acts. It's the birth of the church, Shia. It's when the church first started. So the people that wrote it, well, actually it's Luke. He was a doctor. He's going back to old stories, and he's trying to bring the truth. So he's talking about King David, right? But watch this. And when he had removed him, now God is talking about King Saul. If you go back and read the Old Testament, before David was king, when he still was a teenager, and when he killed Goliath, Ron, Saul was the king at that time. Everybody say King Saul. So he was the king before David. So it says when God had removed him. This is important. If you're not doing what God told you to do, God will remove you. God will give your job to someone else if you walk around on your cell phone all day like your boss is paying you to text. See how it got quiet? So after he removed him, God's talking about King Saul, the previous king before David. He raised up for them David as king. Say David as king. So that means, Maurice, that Deacon Maurice, that God chose David, and if he's going to make David the king from a king that wasn't doing right, David must be doing a lot of stuff right. Now watch, because this is me and you sitting here. He raised up for them David as king, to whom also God gave testimony and said. Now, there's not too many times where God is actually giving a testimony for somebody. So this is what it means. God says, I'm going to speak about this person. His name is David, and I want to tell you how I feel about him, Miss Yolanda. Here's what God said. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. This is not a person talking, Twilight. This is God. God says, here is David, and David is a human after my own heart. How many guys would take that as a compliment? Huh? Is that big, mind? Would you love for God to appear and say, Mon, you are a man after my own heart. I would like it for a couple minutes. Because that means he's watching. <laughs> Who shall fulfill all my will? Can God lie? God says David shall fulfill all of God's will. So somebody explain to me, how does Bathsheba even fit into that then? I'm going to tell you who Bathsheba is in a moment because some of you don't know. How does having an affair with a woman and then killing her husband, who was your bodyguard, I'm going to show you that. How is that fulfilling God's will? Are you ready? You can fulfill God's will as a Christian, but still inject your own nature. God is saying, I have 10 things for David to do, H. He did all 10, but he added five. A lot of people don't understand. He added five, and those five I don't like. But he did all of my will. But he added five. So for the five, he's going to reap what he sowed. And just because he's a Christian, just because you go to Abundant Living Family Church, High Desert, the longest name in churches, doesn't mean, Pam, we can get away with stuff. Now, can I tell you a deep truth today? Some of us are still living like the old David when we have done some things that make us the new David. I don't understand, Pastor Mark. Okay, I'm glad you asked. David's nature was stable when you read the Old Testament from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel chapter 10. Now repeat these words after me. He was a warrior. He was a worshiper. He was a lover of the word of God. He was a worshiper. I know I'm saying, okay, first of all, let me explain something because I have to explain this. I'm from Indiana. And when I say worshiper, the people from California go, why does he say were? It's war. Worship. I'm country. I grew up with my mom and dad saying, where's your face? Going to 
can't wash your face. You want me to wash my face? Yeah, wash your face. He was a warrior. He was a worshiper. He was a lover of the word. All three. You ready for this? Worshiper? What? Warrior? What? Word. The three archangels in the Bible, Vaughn. Lucifer was a worshiper. Gabriel was a word, messenger. Michael is the warrior. Ooh. David represented all three of the archangels that we see in the Bible, what they did. He was powerful. But something happened. And here's what I want to tell you today. Reaping and sowing is a principle. And even though you look good now, even though you're a shiny penny now, Jason, even though you look all good now, your hair's all slicked back, all of us have to deal with our past life if we don't repent of it. Wait a minute, what? Oh, I'm going to show you. So what was David? And he loved the word. He wrote most of the Psalms. Right? So how many of y'all know this is a heavy dude? As a teenager, he killed a giant. How many of y'all know that's big, Nate? Now, are you ready? Because here's what most people miss. We know about Bathsheba. Watch. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. Now, we're going back to the Old Testament. Remember I told you he was good from 1 Samuel, the whole book, and he was good up to 2 Samuel chapter 10? Now, watch this. Even if you've been in church a long time, you're going to grab something. So, David has grabbed this woman named Bathsheba, and he slept with her. Bathsheba was married to a man named Uriah. Uriah was one of David's bodyguards early on. How many of you know, if you have a bodyguard, y'all are pretty close? How many of you know, if you have a bodyguard, you know the bodyguard's life, and the bodyguard knows your life? Come on now, we're going to go deep, right? Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men in the cave. So Uriah knew David's family, but David knew Uriah's family. When they were in the cave, before David became the king, Frank, David knew Uriah was married to Bathsheba. He knew Bathsheba and Uriah had a dad, and grandpa, his name was Ohithophel. David knew their life. So when David looked over, the Bible says, when kings go out to war, so this is a lesson, men, if you're not where you're supposed to be, your eyes and your body get you in trouble. The Bible said when kings go out to war, David should have been out fighting, but he stayed home because he was being lazy. And because all the men were out fighting, the women used to take baths on top of the house. Now, it ain't like us right now. We have baths and showers. They didn't have all that. So a woman would bathe on the top of the roof because there were no men in town to see her. So she was not out of line. She was doing what women do. But David was out of line because he was a man out of position. So David looks over and sees this beautiful black woman. Did you say black woman? Some of y'all don't know Bathsheba was black. Oh, boy. So she was taking a shower like this. <laughs> no, I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> Where's Kendra? Is she in here? Okay, where's she at? Is she in the foyer, Lou? So she can hear me? Snaps. Okay. So it, uh-oh, the door is open. The door always open back then. So Bathsheba's taking a bath, and David looks over, because he ain't got no business being there. He looks over, and he sees her. And he says, bring her to me. And he knew who she was, and by doing that, he knew he was getting ready to sleep with. Now watch, I'm going to use a word that people don't use, rape. When a person of power grabs a person underneath them, and that person underneath them don't know what's going to happen if they don't obey, it's rape. David is a person of influence, and he raped Bathsheba. But he knew Bathsheba's husband was fighting actually for him and was one of the fiercest fighters. How many of you know this is not good? Now, I caught you up. Watch. So now the prophet comes. He's a person that speaks on behalf of God and tells David, Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, evil in God's sight? See, what some people think is evil, um, God 
has a different opinion than what people think. So God can think something is evil and you can think it's okay. But how many of you know you ain't got no power to do evil in the sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite. I'm going to explain that in a minute. With the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. Not only did he rape her, he married her after he had her husband killed. You have taken his wife to be your wife. Verse 10. Now therefore, the sword, say sword. Sword represents judgment. The sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me, David. I put you as king. I'm God. And you have despised me by raping Bathsheba, killing her husband, and then marrying her. you making me look bad, God said. And you have taken, he says it again, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. For you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel. Before the sun, which means out in the open. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned. Nathan was the prophet. I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. David came to himself. He's already raped Bathsheba. He's already killed her husband. He's already married the woman that he raped. And then he says this, I have sinned. This is the reason God said he's a man after his own heart. Because David will quickly repent. The problem is he's already sold. Oh. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also, this is so big, put away your sin. You shall not die. But, and I added the but. If you read it, it ain't in there. Now, please listen, look at me and focus. When you do stuff, God has mercy. That's what we're getting ready to ask for in a minute. God's, the wages of sin is God could have killed King David. Nathan said, because you have repented, God is not going to kill you, Richard. He's not going to kill you. But the sword is never going to leave your house. Now, are you ready? Today's title, Generational Reaping and Sowing. He said, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to allow your children to be crazy. I'm not going to judge you as harshly as I could. But judgment goes down to the third and fourth generation. Are y'all ready? You ready? Now watch. This is crazy. You know the story of Goliath. You know the story of Bathsheba. I don't know if you've looked at these connections. Watch this. David raped Bathsheba. Here's how he killed Uriah. And this is terrible, Sonia. He wrote a note. They were out in the war. David asked Uriah to come home off the battlefield. But nay, Uriah was such a rider, he was ride or die. He came back and David said, hey man, go sleep with your wife. David wanted Uriah to sleep with his wife because she was pregnant by David. And he said if he sleeps with her, they'll think it's his baby, not mine, and I'm off the hook. So he calls him back from the war Uriah is so tight, he says, how can I go home, sleep with my wife, when my boys are out there fighting for the kingdom? Guess where he slept? On the doorstep. David was so frustrated because of his integrity, he wrote a note and gave it to Uriah. Now, this is the worst part of the story. Uriah carried his own death sentence because the note said, Joab, who was the general, put Uriah in the front where the fighting is the worst, and while he is fighting for me, pull back so he gets killed. He used Uriah's character against him. He knew, number one, he wouldn't open the note. And he knew he would fight hard. So he told Joab, pull back so they kill him, and if he's dead, nobody will find out what I did. And then I'll marry Bathsheba. I'll look like the hero and nobody will see. How many of y'all know 
God sees. How many of y'all know David's already planted? So now David is going to, now are y'all ready? I went through the scriptures and connected six different reapings in David's life, Mike, that tie to everything he did. And then I'm going to get to me and you. Number one, King David's son, David has a son named Amnon. Guess what Amnon did? Raped his half-sister Tamar. They were both David's kids, but David had a lot of women and concubines, right? And so he had kids. He had 19 named kids in the Bible, but Pam, they think he had more than 19. Can you imagine 19 kids and child support? <laughs> he had 19 children. So Amnon, his son, loved his sister until he slept with her. They said he was sick when he would see her. He loved her so much. So he faked being sick, told David to send her over. She comes over to cook. He kicks all the slay, all the servants out, and he rapes her. And then the meat, immediately after he rapes her, and this is what happens, is a thin line between love and hate. Immediately after he rapes her, he tells her, get out, and kicks her out. And now that she's been raped, Back in the Bible, they would call it she's been soiled and not married. She can't marry anybody else because everybody else knows that her virginity has been taken. And ain't like right now. Now people just give away virginity like it's candy. <laughs> but back then, it wasn't a good thing. So Amnon, David's son, what does he do? He rapes Tamar, his sister. Why? David raped Bathsheba. Oh, look at your outline. Turn your outline over. He sold with Bathsheba. He reaped with his daughter. Now, some of us dads probably should have put two layers of deodorant on today. Because we have mistreated some women in our past. And now we have daughters Reaping number two, King David's son Absalom murders his brother Amnon. Absalom is another son. He kills Amnon because him and Tamar had the same mama. So he planned and waited. He said, Tamar, come live with me. The Bible says she lived with him her whole life, never got married, never had children because David decided to rape Bathsheba. Her brother Absalom says, come live with me. I'll take care of you. And for her whole life, she never dated, never was around anybody else. How many of y'all know that's a judgment? How many of y'all know it wasn't her fault? How many of y'all know it's tied to her daddy raping another woman? Are y'all starting to get something here? So David's son Absalom, Tamar's brother, murders Abnon, called him out for a party, and had everybody stab him and kill him. What is that tied to? Uriah was like David's brother because Uriah was his bodyguard. And because he was his bodyguard, they knew each other. And David killed his brother. So his son killed his brother. Ah, uh, y'all. Reaping number three. King David's son, Absalom, rebelled against his dad. Absalom took over the kingdom temporarily, kicked David out, Miss Fran, and I know tomorrow's your birthday. I love you. Absalom kicked David out, took over his kingdom, and tried to become king and was going to kill his daddy. Do you know why Absalom's kingdom was going to kill his daddy? Because his daddy let Amnon rape his sister. Oh. King David's son Absalom rebelled against his dad and temporarily took control of the kingdom. Watch this. You know what he did? Y'all know what he did? Huh? Watch. He rebelled against the throne because King David rebelled against the throne. God the Father is David's father, like he's our father, and David rebelled against God's throne 
So his son rebelled against his throne, reaping and sowing. Are y'all ready for this one? Watch this one. Reaping number four. King David's son Absalom had sex publicly with his dad's wives and concubines and harem on top, you can't make this up, on top of a roof. How many of y'all remember the story I just told you? Where was Bathsheba? On a roof. What was she doing? Bathing. Bathing. Where did David see her? Y'all got to get this. Where did David see Bathsheba? On a roof. He raped her in private. So God says, what you did in secret, you're going to reap in public. So Absalom had sex outside in the middle of the day with all David's wives and concubines. Now, people miss this. Are you ready? Guess who told Absalom to have sex with all David's wives? Ohithophel, Bathsheba's grandpa. Wait, wait, wait. What'd you say? Bathsheba's grandpa knew what David did. He said, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. And he whispered in Absalom's ear, hey, why don't you have sex with all your daddy's women? And Absalom said, that sounds like good advice. But guess what? The grandpa of the woman that was raped gave it. How many of y'all knew that? That's real deep. What David did in private, he did in public. Write this down, please. Put it in your phone. This is so crazy, and this is why we need the mercy of God in a couple minutes. Write this down. You reap later and greater. Come on, son. You remember that. We preached that over there in that building. You always reap later and greater. Pastor Mark, prove it. One apple seed has 120 trees in it. If you plant an apple seed, it'll grow a tree. The tree has apples. Every apple has six seeds. If all those apples fall on the ground, they will plant other apple trees from one seed. The Bible says though Jesus went in the ground and died like a seed, it'll bring life. Jesus died on the cross so all of us could come into the kingdom. You always reap later and greater. So if you sow one bad word, you might reap ten. If you mistreat one person as a believer, you might get mistreated by multiple people. Most of us don't even know, like we didn't know last week with our words, that we're living out our own reaping. Okay. Y'all looking at me funny. Reaping number five. David's son Absalom got murdered by Joab after he murdered Amnon, his brother. What is that tied to? Joab is the one who murdered Uriah by pulling back the troops because David told him to. So Joab is like, huh, if you want me to murder Uriah, you can't say nothing to me when I murder your son for trying to take the kingdom. You just acting like a weak king and a punk. So I'm going to take matters in my own hands because you put the matters in my hands before. Are y'all listening? Look at all these reapings tied to David's sowing. Now watch. David's son Absalom is murdered by Joab. He was riding his horse. His hair was so long like mine used to be. And it got wrapped up in the tree. And he was swinging in the tree. And ten of his servants came and they stabbed him. Joab and them stabbed him up. David was sad. And Joab said, stop crying, quit being a punk. He tried to take over your kingdom. I handle business you wouldn't handle. Because David handled business he shouldn't have handled. Reaping number six. King David's son, Adonijah, killed, was killed by King David's other son, Solomon. Solomon was the baby from David and Bathsheba. So God can still have mercy. 
but Solomon was on the throne. Adonijah tried to take the throne from Solomon, and Solomon killed Adonijah for being deceptive. Why would Adonijah be killed by Solomon? Solomon was trying to take the throne. His mama was asking, trying to take the throne from Solomon. And Solomon said, you think you're slick. You know what that's attached to? Nathan telling David, you think you're slick and God don't see you. You think killing Uriah is cleaning up your mess. God sees your mess. And the sword will never leave your house. Everything David did was connected to his kids. Now, you ready? Everybody say, what's the point? We have to always pay attention to our nature. Notice God said, David is a man after my own heart. Watch this, Kendra. God didn't say he's a man after my own nature. Wait a minute. Y'all should have got that. Did you hear that? Somebody should have shouted. That was good. No, it's too late, Mr. Lord. <laughs> he said, you're a man after my own heart. But God didn't say you're a man after my own nature. Nature in the Greek means phusis, and phusis means prevailing tendencies and structure. God said, you're a man after my own heart, but you're not a man after my own tendencies. Because David, nobody can see you got a sex problem. Okay, y'all don't want this. This is where you start getting nervous and sweating. You can be a worshiper. You can be a warrior. You can be in your word. And still act like a pervert. Because sometime worshiping, sometime our fights are fleshly, Sometimes we're reading the word out of religion, not relationship. And just because we're reading doesn't mean we're receiving. But somebody's always telling you, I read my Bible all the time. Be careful. Be careful. Because just because you're reading don't mean you're receiving. And David, after all that worship, after all that word, after all that warrioring, didn't let God take this perversion out of him. So he was still a rapist writing the Psalms. You got to pay attention to your nature. I have to pay attention to mine. Our past does not dictate our future with God. This is big today. Either way, whether you are good, 1 Samuel, all the way through 2 Samuel chapter 10, you've killed Goliath, but now look. Now here it is. This is so big. Weeping may endure for a night, but reaping can be generational and affect those behind us. We always say weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. What's the point? Guess what? Weeping may endure for a night, but reaping don't. David's kids should have been princes, princesses, worshipers, Psalmist, you don't see any of them doing anything in the Bible. When from their lineage came Jesus. God skipped David's lineage, even though David was referred to all the time and a man after God's own heart. It's not enough for me and you to be after God's heart. We got to also have the tendencies God has so we don't offend him. Lift your hands. <laughs> Old stories, new truth. Lift your hands. This has been a setup. It's been a setup for you to ask for forgiveness. 
It's been a setup for you to ask for mercy based on your mom, your dad, your grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. If this happened to David's family, I guarantee you it's happening to yours and the family that's coming behind you. But isn't Jesus good to us that he would teach us this and then come with his power to reverse this? Lift your hands high. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I cannot stop reaping and sowing because it's a principle. I know I have been broken by my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my parents, and their curses have come down to me. And I unknowingly have been living them out. But today, I hold the scripture higher than my pain and my experience. Galatians 3, 13 says, Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. Lord Jesus, that refers to you taking all the curses, taking all my curses, and burying them in the grave. Today, I connect the dots, and I ask you, forgive my lineage for passing down curses to my life. Today, I ask for mercy in my life. Now, I switch gears, and I admit I have broken the generation behind me, or I would have broken the generation that is coming. But today, I repent. Today, I repent. And I ask you for mercy for the generations following me. Today, I apply the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus over all my children, children's children, and a thousand generations. They will not go through what I have been through because today you are faithful. Every generational curse is stopped today because of your mercy. Amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, you averted some danger today. Come on, you changed some paths today. Come on, you broken some things that you did not know even exist. Now lift your hands. I'm going to pray over you. Now in the name of Jesus, I break every generational curse over every man, woman, and child in this place. Now I command addiction is broken in Jesus' name. I command sexual perversions are broken in the name of Jesus. I command today, Father, every negative pattern in your people today that was handed down that they did not know eating disorders right now eating abuses right now father right now in the name of Jesus I command God that we become clean because of the work of Christ I thank you God we will not carry come on lift your hands we will not carry mental illness ah ah, ah. We will not carry mental disorders. We will not carry fear from previous generations. We will not, if this hit you, you stand to your feet. We will not carry anxiety in the name of Jesus. We will not carry sickness. Ah, we will not carry sickness. We will not carry relational dysfunction. 
Ah, we will not carry divorce. We will not carry toxic relationships. We will not carry infirmities handed down from previous gender. Lift your hands, being healed. Right now, I command in Jesus' name, your body is being healed, arthritis, diabetes, blood disorders, stomach disorders, uh, joint disorders. Right now, someone's intestine, stomach being healed. That's it, that's it, Brooke. Come on, healing, come. Lift your hands. Come on, come on. We're cleaning house. Lift your hands on Facebook. We're cleaning house. Divine healing, Jesus. Holy Spirit, hover. Holy Spirit, back pains that have been chronic from generations. In the name, come up here, Kendrick. Come. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Lift your hands high. Infirmities in your bones, in your family. Infirmities in your blood that have come down from your families. In the name of Jesus, lift your hands. You be healed by the power of Jesus. Be healed if you're watching. Some of you are sick, and the sickness has been handed down by your words and your grandparents. Lift your hands. Be healed in Jesus' name. You have been forgiven, and God is bringing mercy to your reaping and sowing. God is bringing mercy to your reaping. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you that you shorten the time of reaping, that you shorten the time to the minimal. It's a principle, so it can't be removed. But we can pray for your grace. We can pray for your mercy on the time. And I pray that you diminish the consequences of this reaping in Jesus' name. Father, for some of us, the sword has been in our house. But I'm praying and asking you to remove the sword from our house because of our previous choices in our previous life. Addictions are broken. Infirmities are broken. Curses are broken. And I thank you, Father, that even though curses go to three and four generations, blessings go to a thousand. So right now, in Jesus' name, on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ, because I have no power, I pronounce a blessing down to a thousand generations. And we pronounce your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are free today. Come on, give God a shout. Come on, give God a shout. Come on, praise God. Praise God. Your children are free. Your children are free. Your children are free. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, lift your voice. Tell God, thank you. Tell, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be free. Now repeat after me, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me for all my sins. Pull up every seed. Pull up every seed that was not of you. Come into my heart. Give me a new heart and a new spirit. Change how I live, walk, and talk. Today, I am born again. Because I am forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him a shout today. Come on, shout like you just got your next generation free. Shout, shout like your children just got free. Shout like your grandchildren are going to be free. Now listen to me very carefully and then you can be seated. Some of your children are not serving God. Today, the Lord just told me, he said, I have flipped it. And before the end of this year, you're going to see your children with a renewed love and passion and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Lord says, some of your children don't go to church. He said, church is not the thing that saves people. He said, but so you know that I have transformed your children, you're going to see them begin to come to church, and that will be a sign to you that I have moved and I have lessened the reaping from your previous life. Today, he said, I have saved not only your children, but your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a shout. Come on, you can do better than that. God is great, and his mercy endures forever. You may be seated. Ah, hallelujah. Uh, lift your hand. Uh, 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 oh, oh, uh, tell God thank you. Just tell him thank you. We're running out of time. Just tell him thank you. Uh, 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 I'm up here for my children, God. I'm up here for my babies. I'm up here for my babies, God. Come on, worship him for your babies. Worship him for your children. Oh, he's not done yet. He's not done yet. Oh, God, move in every generation. Break every yoke. Break every yoke. Break every yoke. God, remove my perversions. Remove my addictions, God, from my children. Remove, God, the times I didn't want to. Remove the times I didn't. Uh, remove, God, remove, God, the times when I didn't listen. Remove the times I didn't go to church. I had years when I didn't go to church, God. Remove that from my children. Come on, tell God whatever you need to tell him. One more minute. Come on. I repent, God. I'm so thankful for today. Mercy on my generations. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I sold so much mercy. <laughs> mercy, God, mercy. Mercy on my children, God, mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Forgive me, God. <sighs> Oh, forgive me for my drug use. Forgive me, God. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Break yokes every generation. Break yokes every generation. Clean every generation, God. Clean up my children's mind, will, and emotions. Clean up every generation, the blood of Jesus over my kids and grandbabies. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. A new day, a new day, a new season, a new season. You can fade it, Brooke. Great job back there today, great job. God is pounding through every generation. He's pounding through every generation. Oh. 
I don't know what to do. I'm out of, we're out of time. I don't know what to do. Lift your hand. I don't know what to do. Freedom, freedom, liberty and freedom, liberty and freedom, freedom from relational trauma, freedom from infirmities, freedom from sickness, your children free from parental drama, free from the effects of divorce, Jesus, minimize it, children free from separation, free from toxic behavior, free from alcohol, lift your hand. In the name, uh, in the name of Jesus, every generation below us, Father, free from alcohol addiction. Right now, I speak, God, on your behalf. I plead the blood of Jesus, no more drinking. No more drinking. Children, free. Uh, lift your hand, you be free. In the name of Jesus. God has taken away that spirit of bondage right now on Facebook. You're, you're drinking alcohol. I command the taste to be removed from your mouth. In the name, this is a move of God, and I don't care how it looks right now. This is a move of God. If you don't understand, just lift your hands, ask God to show you. In the name of Jesus, every alcohol addiction broken. In the name of Jesus, every drug addiction, lift your hands on your children, for your children, lift your hands. Every drug addiction, prescription, and street drugs right now, I thank you right now. I push back, I push back on the legalization of marijuana where this generation is deceived, thinking it's okay. In the name of Jesus, I command marijuana addictions. I speak to the heavenlies. I bind those principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that are controlling a whole generation to smoke and be out of their mind. I break it in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of bondage bondage that is in control of every addiction. Lift your hand over your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and over you. The desire be removed. The desire be removed to smoke. The desire for pills be removed supernaturally, 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 without counseling. The desire removed by Jesus in us and in our children. It takes us out of our mind and makes our mind not clear. Jesus, last thing, we will not sow to our flesh. We will sow to the spirit because we are reaping destruction. Right now, divorces, toxic relationships, broken. Jesus, would you reverse the effects, please? Would you reverse the effects? The effects, please, Father, we repent as a church. We repent those that are watching on Facebook and those that will be shared to. We repent, God, and whatever move you're doing now in the church, would you please do it at home and as they share it, God. Let this anointing stay for weeks and months and years so the yokes are broken in Jesus' name. Now I want you to be still. Sit down. Lift your hands, Brooke. I want everybody to turn around. She's been back there by herself all day. Doing the media and doing the sound. All by herself. So right now, I know you haven't been able to focus, so this is your time. You're always working. You're always working. In the name of Jesus, specifically, Brooke, I cancel every generational curse that has come down from your parents, 
in the name of Jesus, I command that it is over. It is over. And your son, Josiah, your son, I ask for a canopy on top of him. And um, I see an umbrella on top of him that's red, and it represents the blood of Jesus, Jesus said. He says specifically, he has your son. And here's what he said. He said, behaviors that are new that you have been noticing, right now he is handling and he is taking care of. Right now, I plead the blood of Jesus over Josiah that a, a supernatural peace is going to come over him. His sleeping is going to change. His sleeping pattern is going to change in Jesus' name. And nothing, nothing that would come down from both of his parents, right now it is canceled. A lot of what you lived through was generational, and the Lord said it is over. He said he is rewarding today. Number one, he loves you. But number two, your faithfulness. I watched you move back there, and I know you weren't able to receive. So this is your moment. This is your tithe right now. Lift your hands high. Father, I cancel everything negative. She worked so hard, God, and things have not always turned out the way she has thought. But I pray a new season right now, a new season of provision. But what you need more than anything is a new season of peace. So I bind any spirits of fear and anxiety that have been trying to attack you. I want you to sit down, Brooke, back there. Sit, sit. Anything that's been trying to attack you, lift your hand. Been trying to attack you, I curse it in Jesus' name. No more fear. You haven't been sleeping well. Sweet is your sleep because you are taught of the word. So I prophesy now over your sleep pattern, you have not been resting, which has made you more tired than normal. Right now, a supernatural breath of God, the supernatural breath of God in peace. And you'll know by tonight, by your sleep tonight. You'll know by your sleep tonight. You'll know by your sleep tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All of it's done. Do not look behind you anymore. Amen. We forget about our workers sometimes. So listen, we've got, do we have any pressing announcements? Okay. So today was a move of God. Last week and today, these old stories have come up here, baby. Have powerful new truths. Receive it today. But your generations are free today, and you're free today from everything that has happened before you. Amen? Come on, give him a shout. All right. This is a great time to sow and give. Come on, give him a shout to God. When God moves like that, it's a good time to sow. We talked about sowing, amen? So listen, I want you to get, get your best gift right now in Jesus' name. Please don't forget our gas program. Listen, we have to take care of one another. Your gas generosity is on top of your tithes and offering. Last week, only $40 came in. And I understand we, have, we were praying for people, but you have to hear me. It is my heart that this church take care of each other. Okay, we have to take care of each other. And some of you are blessed and you haven't had to spend as much money on gas. I need you to stay focused after service and sow a seed. Well, guess what? You're just going to reap a blessing. But we have to take care of those. I had enough this week to get it done. So if you signed up, your gas card is ready to go. But I know you might be tired of hearing about it. But the gas prices haven't come down yet. So when you're giving your tithes and offerings, you're taking care of the church. When you're giving your special offering, you're taking care of your brothers and sisters who have the unfortunate situation of working and living down the hill. Amen? Ushers, you can begin to receive the tithes and offerings. I'm just going to pray over you now. Lift your hand for the sake of time. Father, I love you and I honor you so much, and I thank you. I thank you that this seed going in the ground is special today because of the sowing and reaping. I thank you. Those, Father, are gonna, that drive down the hill, that spend a lot on gas, whatever their job is, that there's a supernatural provision 
over them that they're not going to feel the effects of this inflation. I thank you for those that are going to plant a seed, God, that you would open doors that no man can close. I thank you, God, I feel this very strongly, supernatural healing, just a supernatural healing in the bodies of your people today and in the mind of your people today. I feel like some of their inheritance, Father, in their minds, some of the mental weakness maybe has been handed down from grandparents and great-grandparents and parents, and today it's been stabilized. Jesus, you are called the Prince of Peace, so today we honor you as the Prince of Peace. I thank you that everything we're saying is no longer historical. It's no longer historical, but the power of the scriptures, the power of Jesus is going through time unhindered. And I thank you we receive today. Let this be a supernatural offering for those that are here and those that are watching. Let it be supernatural. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now, come on, give him a shout. I'm so sorry we're over time. The last two weeks, I've not been holding to the time, and I want to apologize for that, but I just don't know what to do sometimes. And sometimes I hate the time limits when there's moves of God. But I want you to forgive me for that because it's still not appropriate. Children's Church is running, and I'm throwing everything off. Sunday school. So Facebook, we love you. God bless you. Let's everybody say goodbye, Facebook, our Facebook campus. We love you. And the same power that was here is the same power is you. So on the count of three, let's say we are abundant nation. One, two, three. We are abundant nation. God bless you.